Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, January 25th, we are studying Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. As crowds continue to gather around Jesus to be healed and delivered from demons, Jesus goes up a mountain and appoints his 12 apostles. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor James Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you. It's good to be back. Pastor Preuss, as we get started this morning, let's talk context, the gospel of Mark as a whole, the text leading up to what we get today. What do we need to know going in? Well, this is early in the gospel of of Mark, and uh, one thing that to know about the Gospel of Mark is it's the shortest of the Gospels. It's only 16 chapters long. Um, of course, I mean, the chapters can be different lengths. I think Luke is longer than John, or longer than uh, Matthew, even though it has fewer chapters. But anyway, it's the shortest of the Gospels, uh, and, and it moves very quickly along. And another, another thing to know about it is, I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think it's something like 85% of Mark fits into the Gospel of Matthew. Mm. Uh, that's it's why it's called the synoptic, uh, the synoptic gospels. If you've heard that term, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels because they they go together so well, and n- none of the gospels go t- together so well as Matthew and Mark, specifically Mark to Matthew. Uh, the other thing is because Mark is so much shorter, it goes a lot quicker. Uh, so if you're reading through Matthew, and then you read through Mark, you're like, oh, this is kind of going through the same story. Except, you know, it takes you into chapter 9 for you to get to Jesus healing the paralytic. And Ma- uh, Mark already has that in chapter 2. And now in chapter 3, we have the calling of the disciples, and Matthew doesn't get that until chapter 10. Uh, and then, of course, he takes the whole chapter doing it, whereas uh, Mark does a bunch of other things in chapter three. So Mark uh, kind of just gets to the he gets to the point, but Mark also has a lot of these gems that the other gospels don't have, um, and uh, details that that the other gospels don't have. So, for example, when with like the uh, the Gerardines, the, the demon-possessed man, the Gerardines, that's where he says, I am legion, for we are many. Whereas Matthew, I don't think, gives, gives the name. and Just examples like that. So Mark's an exciting gospel. If you, if, if you want to read one gospel, I almost recommend that you just read Mark. Just simply, it's the first one, just simply because it's so short. And uh, you can read it, you know, in afternoon. Yeah, he, he really does get to the point, just as a, an example of that, that we've seen very recently here, just in the text we looked at previously, Mark 3, verse 6, the Pharisees and the Herodians are already plotting here at the beginning of chapter 3, how to kill Jesus. That's I mean, that's he hasn't done a whole, well, I suppose he has done a whole lot, but we're only two plus chapters in, and already you're starting to see how Mark is driving you very quickly toward what his point ultimately is, is to show you Jesus yeah. crucified for you already here. I mean, it's just, it's a feature that we see throughout the gospel. No, yeah, ab- absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fun gospel. It's short and, uh, but uh, I, it's definitely worth the read. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And and lots of, as you said, lots of gems in here, even in what seem to be very straightforward texts, there's still plenty to look at and discuss. So let's go ahead and jump right into our text for today, Mark 3, beginning at verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. 
And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, the sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. That is the text for today, Mark 3, verses 7 through 19. Pastor Price, the text starts with Jesus withdrawing. He goes along the sea. We see kind of a summary of his ministry here. What's what's there for us in that first verse of the text? Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch here. Is that really all in the first text? Uh, uh, verse? Yeah. yeah, verse 7 is yeah, a long a, one. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole bunch here, uh, to be honest. And, and then, it, uh, it, and when you look at the map, like I'm, when you're uh, when you first read the Bible, or if you're a kid reading the Bible, or uh, and you're not really, and all these names they don't really mean anything to you. Like I was, it took me a while to kind of figure out, you know, that Jesus is going north and then he's going south mm. and things like that. And the way the Bible speaks, it doesn't speak so much about north and south. Usually, it's up to Jerusalem, uh, whether you're going from the north or from the south. But if you look at the map, and if you're familiar at all with the ancient kingdom of Israel uh, that David ruled, he is going everywhere. Galilee is in the far north, uh, and Judea is in the far south. He goes down to Idumea. Uh, I mean, that is the region of Judah that, I guess, the uh, Edomites in, invaded uh, of, around the time of the, the, the um, exile into Babylon. Uh, and then he, goes, and then he goes all the way back up. He goes, well, says he goes beyond the Jordan. Now, when I would read that, uh, I used to think, oh, well, he's crossing the Jordan. But no, the Jordan's going you know, uh, north and south, and he goes, it's not that he's just crossing the Jordan, he's getting out of the of the region of the Jordan, beyond the Sea of Galilee, way up north on the Mediterranean, just Tyre and Sidon, uh, and, and these are the ancient borders of King David's kingdom. I mean, these are places that were, you know, paying tribute to Solomon and things like that. So um, he's really ga- going around all of Israel, and the fact that he that everywhere he goes, he's picking up followers is very important. Uh, and this, um, well, anyway, that's that's what he's doing right now. I don't know if you want me to get into my next point about uh, about what this what this means. Well, uh, yeah, but it's, yeah, just it's a huge just jump right in because I mean that that carries right into all these regions. These you've already laid out sort of the territory that we're looking at. What is Jesus doing as he's walking around, gaining all these followers from all over the place? Right. Well, yeah. So I'll jump right into there. But first, I, I just looked at my notes, and realized I skipped over them. But uh, this is called. If you want to impress your friends, then you call <laughs> this his peripatetic. Uh, ministry. So peripatetic uh, refers to the Greek word peripateo, which means uh, to to walk like up and down, to walk around. And unfortunately, it's, that word is not in this this pericope right here in Mark chapter three, but it is in other parts of the Bible. I, I forgot to look it up. It's probably in Matthew somewhere. But it perfectly describes what Jesus is doing. Uh, he is walking all all around. Now, what is he doing? So there are three things that it lists. He's preaching the gospel. He is healing the sick, and he's casting out demons. Uh, But why is he doing this? Well, what he's doing is he's gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you have a number of examples of this. So uh, later in this Gospel, Matthew chapter 6, I think it's in uh, the parallel passage in Matthew's in chapter 9, he he looks at the crowd and he has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Well, of course, we know Jesus is the good shepherd. So he's come to gather these sheep. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, which again is a parallel to Matthew cha- uh, Mark chapter 3, which is what we're on right now, um, which I mentioned before, Jesus sends out his disciples, and Matthew has a bit more information there, where he sa- tells the disciples to go 
not to go to the Gentiles, but to go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, and, which is very telling, because in his calling and sending of the, of the apostles, he is telling them to do exactly what he's doing, to preach, to heal, to cast out demons, and that the fact that in Matthew he records that he's telling them to gather or to go to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel tells you that that's what he's doing. That's why he's walking from Galilee to Judah, from Idumea to Tyre uh, uh, and Sidon. Uh, he's gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We all remember the passage, and I'm using Matthew a lot. I like Matthew, but also Matthew gives some details, and Mark doesn't, obviously. But uh, uh, both Matthew and Mark have the story of the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman, who is crying out to Jesus, and it seems like Jesus is re- rejecting her uh, because her daughter is demon possessed. Uh, Matthew gives this line that Mark doesn't, but obviously Jesus said it, where he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I'm not going to get into why Jesus said that to her and that whole testing of that woman's faith, but it's a very telling thing. This is what Jesus is doing. He goes first to the house of Israel, you know, the, the, the nation he is rightfully king of. Uh, and then, of course, you have John 10, where Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. What are they doing? They're following Jesus. Why? because he's their shepherd. So this is a beautiful example of Jesus gathering this great crowd that's growing like a snowball, or rather like a flock that is picking up lost sheep from the wilderness. And this is a picture of what the church is. Uh, and as we see with the sending out of the, the apostles, uh, this is what the church is doing today. The church is still spreading out throughout the whole world, gathering Jesus' sheep. As Jesus also says in John 10, he says, And I have other sheep who are not of this fold, meaning who are not of Israel, and I must call them too, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. So all nations, all the sheep of the whole world, even those outside of Israel, will be gathered to this one flock, which is the Holy Christian Church. Jesus has this flock with him by the Sea of Galilee at this moment, and it's such a great crowd, Mark tells us, that Jesus actually has to get into a boat. So not only is he walking around preaching and gathering the flock of Israel from all over, but now he's actually going to get into a boat with them, or not with them, but for them. We're going to see him in a boat again later in Mark. What's the what's going on with the boat? Well, I think... What the boat is doing, it's showing two things. One, um, how desperate these people are to be close to Jesus. Now, I think it's obvious from other interactions that we have that a lot of people are just thinking the physical thing. Here is a guy who's healing our diseases. I want to touch him. And they're not going to wait for the people in line, so they don't want him to get crushed. But the other thing is, and this is pointed out, that they want to hear him. He's teaching with authority that they've never seen before or heard before, and they want to hear him, they want to be close to him. And the fact that he's getting into the boat, now granted, Jesus can heal from anywhere he is, and we see that with the centurion, uh, who says that he doesn't have to come to his house, and Jesus just says the word. So he doesn't have to lay his hands on them. Although I think it it does say that he is, uh, uh, let's see here, in the perfect view before he lays his hands on them, let's see here, um... Well, anyway, uh, in this in this yeah, text, they, want, they are trying to touch him. So they're trying I mean, to touch him, That's right. right? So, but so Jesus, he makes some distance. So, what, what's going on here? I don't think he's sitting in the boat, you know, saying, "Okay, you're healed, you're healed." Maybe he's doing that. He's does some of that. But the point is, it's showing the importance of teaching. Mm-hmm. Jesus, what Jesus thinks, <laughs> which obviously is the truth is the most important thing that he is doing, is preaching the Word of God. So even if the crowd, if some of the crowd, or most of the crowd, or all of the crowd, thinks that the most important thing that he's doing is casting out their demons and, and teaching, uh, or, and, and healing their ailments, uh, the most important thing Jesus is actually doing is preaching the Gospel and preparing their hearts for the Kingdom of God. And that's something that we have to recognize, too, that the most important mission of the church uh, is spiritual, and it is the gospel. Mark often emphasizes the teaching ministry of Jesus. For as much as Mark does 
race through the story, like we were saying earlier, and, and really gets to the point and often will emphasize the actions of Jesus over the maybe the specific words that he will say. His teaching and preaching ministry does remain central, even in a text like this, where you don't actually, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Lutheran Study Bible, which has the words of Jesus in red. And in our text for today, there are no words in red. And yet that teaching ministry of Jesus, I think it still remains central, like you're saying, in this use of the boat. And later, as he's going to send out the 12, again, to do what? The teaching is going to be a central part of that. Even as Mark emphasizes the actions of Jesus, the teaching goes right along there with it, and I think still remains the central thing. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I mean, it's kind of like, like, why do we have four Gospels? I just read from... Um what is it, the, the, the Treasure Daily Prayer, um, about the, the Ezekiel's vision where he has, like, the four men mm. with the face of a lion, of a, of a man, a lion, uh, an eagle, and an ox, and, uh, you know, and they're being led by the Spirit, where the Spirit goes, they go. And I really do think that this is a prophecy of the four Gospels, that the Gospels are, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are inspired by the Holy Spirit. But we still have to ask, like, why? Why are there all these different ones? And I, my theory with Mark is that you had a bunch of people who were being catechized by the uh, by the apostles. They were growing in faith, but you, they were reaching more and more people who had n- who didn't even know anyone who knew Jesus, except maybe the apostles. If they if they actually knew the apostles, and they're like, you know what, they're missing so much. We don't need something that's going to write down all of the teachings of Jesus, just some of the basic ones. But it's going to give a really good, you know. Uh, rundown of what Jesus' ministry is. I, mean, I don't want to belittle the Gospel of, of Mark in any way, but uh, the, the, the goal of Mark isn't necessarily to, to um, exhaust every teaching that the Christian is supposed to, to learn, but it's more supposed to uh, give a very basic and important lesson on who Jesus is for someone who doesn't know who he is. And then also touching on the very important things of, you know, repent, believe in the gospel, the fact that Jesus uh, was baptized and uh, died on the cross and rose from the dead, and that he and that he instituted the Lord's Supper, and that he said that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. I think that is, the, you know, the mission of, of Mark, and it has its own personality and its own purpose that isn't exactly the same as, as the other gospels. Yeah, and, and that's okay that they wouldn't have the exact same aims and purposes. Of course, they all aim to give faith in Christ and teach you who he is and deliver him to you, but in, in different ways. And I, I like the way you laid that out for Mark. So the text that we've got continues. The people are trying to touch Jesus. They're listening to him teach from the boat. And Jesus is also doing something we've seen him do in Mark's gospel as well. He's casting out unclean spirits. And here we see those unclean spirits again, knowing who Jesus is. In fact, saying it very clearly, you are the son of God. Jesus then tells them, don't say that. He, he strictly orders them not to make them known. So take us into what Jesus is doing here with the exorcism and particularly this matter of not letting the demons speak the truth about who he is. I know. I've, I've struggled with this literally my entire life. Why? Like, why wouldn't you want the demons <laughs> to say, like, isn't this evidence that the demons are, are telling, uh, telling them that he's the Son of God? I mean, if anyone would know, the demons would. I mean, they're the ones who actually, you know, dwell in this heavenly realm. Uh, not that they live in heaven, but like in the spiritual realm. Um, I used the word spiritual realm once when I was, I think it was in Old Testament class. Yeah, because my Old Testament professor said, don't say spiritual realm, say heavenly realm. That's what the Bible says. And I was like, I don't want to say demons are in heaven, but anyway. Uh, so you think they would know. And then even in Philippians chapter 1, uh, Paul talks about how those who are preaching the gospel, and he says, uh, and you know, some are doing it in pretense, right? They're doing it to hurt Paul. And he says, whether in pretense or in truth, you know, so the gospel is proclaimed, and so I rejoice. Uh, so you think, well, if, if they're going to say that he's the Son of God, then why not let him? So there are a couple of ideas for this. I don't think it's simply because they're demons. I do think that's a huge part of it, but it, it can't only be, be because they're demons. Because Jesus says the same thing to those whom he heals, who are not demons. In fact, those, those who, his disciples, right? Uh, 
uh, he says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, don't tell anyone, right? Uh, so, so it's not only because they're demons that he's saying, don't tell anyone, but it's because it's not the time yet. And, uh, like, we know how this works, that a lot of them don't listen to him. They go and they tell people anyway. Uh, then Jesus is forced to have to go out into the wilderness and things like that. But there is a, a thing where Jesus is teaching, he's preparing the way of, of, for himself. I mean, John prepares the way, but he's preparing their hearts for the kingdom of, of heaven. But it's not the time yet they're not to know that he is the Christ. Uh, the other thing I do think is, is part of the fact that they are demons. And demons are evil. We don't realize how evil they are. And uh, they are not... God, Jesus doesn't want to use them in this way. Uh, he's able to use demons for his own good purpose. God does do it, uh, even today with the persecution of the Church. I and mean, this is incited by de- demons, by devils. Um, they are God's... Some people call them their, his jesters to kind of like mock them. But, I mean, the devil is on a rope, and God holds the rope. The devil can only go so far. And often, the devil will be, and his demons, will be doing something that they intend for evil, and God is saying, okay, well, I'm going to use what you're doing for good. So you, you see that with, uh, you know, the Church growing through persecution and, and things like that. Uh, but I guess suffice it to say, I don't know if, if it's sufficient for, for most, but Christ does not desire to use these wicked demons uh, to proclaim his kingdom. Uh, he's going to be using his apostles to do that at the time and the manner that he tells them to do it. And uh, these kingdoms are, they're, he's coming to judge them. And the reason these demons are crying out is not because they love him or because they love his sheep, but because they are terrified and they hate him and we see an example of that uh, when Jesus comes, again, with the legion, with the Gerardines. And uh, I think it's in Matthew's Gospel where he says, um, where the demon says, have you come to torment us before our time? Mm. And um, so they're completely selfish. They don't care about Christ's church. And uh, Christ has every right, and he has a very good purpose, even better than I can express it, uh, to forbid them from speaking. Mm. I think... I- Contextually speaking, the answer that you gave that Jesus doesn't want the demons to be the one to proclaim that he's the son of God, but rather he's going to appoint apostles to do that fits perfectly with the way Mark puts this together for us. Because right after this, which we will talk about, he appoints the 12 apostles to go out and preach. And those are the ones that he wants to bring his word into all the world, just like he is doing at the moment not the demons. I think I think contextually that fits very nicely. And I, I find it to be a helpful reminder because as you said, there are multiple places in the gospel of Mark where Jesus will say to a demon or to someone he's healed, don't say anything. And, and sometimes, and I don't think it's wrong to try to group them together and figure out, is there an overarching strategy there? Because I think there is. But I think you can also look at them individually and say, okay, why in this case would that answer be given? And I think, I think that answer that you gave is, is very good for that reason. What, what makes it ironic though, I think in my mind as, as you were talking about it is that the disciples, the disciples themselves, at least in Mark's gospel, don't name Jesus as the son of God ever. Peter calls him the Christ in, in Mark chapter eight. But he doesn't name him the son of God, at least as, as Mark records it, which is, it's just, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I'm making any theological point at this, at this point, but it's, it's ironic that Jesus would use those men who, for the majority of his ministry, really not until Pentecost, they don't get it. And yet that's who he right. chooses to, to go and proclaim the gospel. It's just, I, I suppose it's a, it's a comfort to us that, that he would choose folks like us to do that even in our weakness. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think I think there is something there. <clears throat> I mean, granted, in, in Matthew's passage of, of that same uh, Mark, w- w- with Peter calling him the right. Christ, he does call him the Son of the Living God. But yeah, you're right; they don't get it. And then you have these demons who seem appear to have a greater knowledge. But again, it has to do with this whole: um, uh, how can you preach unless you are sent? Yeah. And uh, we should be very wary of people who appoint themselves to preach. No, you should be sent. You should be called 
by the church and those who are not called. And that's another thing, too. Like when they get after the transfiguration, there are some disciples come up and say, hey, there's a guy to cast out demons in your name, but he didn't follow us. So we told him, stop. And Jesus says, don't tell him to stop if he's doing my will. And I think a lot of people interpret this, oh, here's a guy who just decided that he was going to go and preach. Well, it's very possible, and I think it's probable in that passage. Sorry to go off on a different text. I think it's probable in that text that Jesus did call him. I mean, just think about it. He sent the disciples out, and then they come back later. Jesus can do whatever he wants while they're gone, right? Or even when they're there. Uh, so it could very well be that Jesus called someone else and said, hey, you, you too, you go, you go and preach, and the disciples didn't know about him. I think that's much more likely than that some guy just decided that he's going to cast out demons some, one day, and then, uh, and then Jesus just said, hey, no, no, if that's what's in his heart, let him do it. No, I, I, that, that seems to con- contradict what Jesus normally does and what the Church normally does. Yeah, Jesus is in the business of calling people to himself and then sending them out. And we see that in our text today, the second part of it, which we will pick up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, January 25th. We're looking at Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. We've got Pastor James Preuss with us. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, prior to the break, we're looking at the first part of the text where Jesus is gathering to himself the lost sheep of the house of Israel from all over. And as our text continues in verse 13, Jesus goes up on a mountain and he calls particularly 12. When you think about the history of Israel, it just doesn't seem a coincidence to me that he would go on a mountain here and call 12 to himself. What do you think? No, I don't think it's a a coincidence at all. Uh, As you know, there are 12 tribes of Israel. Those are the 12 sons of Jacob who become tribes, uh, and all two sons of of, uh, Joseph, Ephraim, and and, uh, Manasseh. Uh, And then I guess you lose Levi with the territory. But there are 12 sons of uh, 12 tribes of Israel, and, uh, and uh, they're all gathered in the Old Testament on Mount Sinai. When they, they go down to Israel, or they go down to Egypt, uh, 75 in number, the 12 sons of Jacob, and Jacob goes down with them, and then they're led out as a great nation. I think it's something like 600-some thousand uh, men tw- uh, of, who are of the age of fighting, so it's probably a, a number of like 2 or 3 million, and they're all gathered around uh, Mount Sinai, where they are given the law through Moses, and then they are through the law. Uh, they are then apportioned, like through Moses, and then um, Blasius Joshua. They are apportioned this land in in Israel, and then here you have this New Testament kind of rehashing of Jesus, who is you know the prophet arisen from among them, uh, who is like Moses, like that fulfillment of the Deuteronomy 18 passage where God says that He will raise up a prophet from among their brothers like Moses, and he will put his words in his mouth. And here Jesus calls these 12, uh, which you know corresponds with the 12 tribes of Israel. So then the number 12 is not just simply the number of Israel, which is God's chosen people, but also the number of the Church. And this is a consistent theme throughout Scripture, uh, and we see it in Revelation 2 with the 12, the 12 thrones. Uh, and Jesus says to the disciples, let's on 12 thrones. So... Uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a huge theme, and it also it shows the spiritual fulfillment of that prophecy given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, he tells Abraham, "Look at the stars in heaven; so shall your offspring be." And uh, Martin Luther actually explains this that there are, there's a, two sides of this this promise. He tells him, to "Look at the stars," and he tells him, to "Look at the dust." He says, "The dust uh, that refers to the nation of Israel; the stars that refers to the." 
spiritual mm. Israel. And here we're seeing that. We're seeing the fulfillment of this pro- promise, of the beginning of the fulfillment that, uh, this, that this 12 represents. Mm. So Jesus on this mountain, he calls the ones he desires. They come. It says he appoints 12 whom he also names apostles. Up to this point, he's talked about, we've heard Mark talk about Jesus' disciples. Here he says Jesus names 12 of them apostles. What's the significance of naming some of these disciples as apostles? Well, that's a good question. I think first we have to to remember what a disciple is. So the Greek word for disciple is mythetes, uh, which comes from the word to learn. So a uh, disciple is a learner, is a, is a student, uh, which is also why he calls them to both to be with him and then also to send them out. Uh, and this shows that this is the, pre- the prerequisite to be an apostle, and I'll explain what an apostle is in a second, is to be a student, which again is why St. Paul, the apostle, tells Timothy, who is a pastor, uh, that he has to devote himself to the the preaching to the to the reading of scripture, and that he should um, focus on what he has been taught and 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 pay attention to the doctrine, the sound doctrine. Uh, so, in order to be an apostle, you have to be a disciple. But not all uh, disciples are apostles. Now, apostle that again comes from the the Greek word uh, for uh, for one who is sent, and uh, the, an apostle is chosen by Jesus. They do not choose Jesus. Uh, as it says in our text, he called uh, those who he desired. So it's not that they went and applied for the job, but Jesus called them. Uh, another place, Jesus says, you know, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Uh, and then he sends them out uh, to do a task. And I mentioned this earlier in the first part of this program. Uh, for, there are two things that he mentions in Mark, and if you include Matthew, there are three. Uh, one is to preach, and number two is to have authority to cast out demons. And I think with the authority to cast out demons, that, with that includes the healing. Um, you, you can't really separate the casting out of demons and the healing of these ailments. It kind of seems that demons are um, the cause of many of them. Uh, Matthew, in, his, in chapter 10, goes into a lot more detail. <clears throat> he tells them what to preach. So again, that's kind of my, my comment before, where Mark is just He's going through what Jesus did, but he's, it's assuming that you're being, it's being read by someone who has other information about what the Christian Church teaches. Uh, but Matthew goes into more detail. He says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He tells them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Uh, he tells them what they should say when they go into each town. Uh, he says, don't bring any money with you, uh, that you should, uh, you know, labor gets there his wages. Uh, and he just goes on and on about what you should do if they reject you, you know, shake the dust off your feet. Uh, so G- he goes into a lot more detail in Matthew 10th, uh, and Matthew's gospel, his, his portion of the story. Now, so we understand the apostle is sent by God, or, or he's sent, he's a sent one, so in this case he's sent by Jesus. So he's very similar to what a pastor is, but he's not the same. So the task is largely the same. He's to preach the gospel, that's the primary task. And later he's supposed to baptize and administer the sacrament and to absolve. And in fact, his disciples are probably already baptizing now, uh, as we see in John chapter 3, that, the, that John's, the, the Jesus' disciples are already baptizing, even before Mark 16. Um, the big difference between an apostle from, the, you know, from this time and a pastor, as we know them today, or an elder, as Scripture speaks of them, an elder, a presbyter, or a, or a bishop, is that pastors or elders or bishops, whatever you want to call them, are called immediately. That is through the church. There is an intermediary between that between the pastor becoming a pastor uh, and God, and that is the church. As uh, Saint Paul tells Titus, that you know you should, he says, remember the gift that you received with the laying on of hands of the elders. Uh, that was in, t- in First Timothy chapter four, and then Titus chapter. One, he says, you know, appoint elders in every town. So they are called immediately through the church. An apostle is called directly by God, or in this, in, in this case, Jesus, who is, of course, God. This means that the teaching of the apostles is indisputable, trustworthy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, on par with the writings of the prophets and authority. So you see what St. Paul says about the meaning of his apostleship in Galatians 
chapter 1, where he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And then he goes on to say that even if, an, if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. So, so Paul, like when he calls himself an apostle, and Galatians is the be- chapter 1 is the best example of this, he is showing that his authority is absolute. You consider his words to be the words of God, because he's not sent by man or through men, but he is sent by God directly, and, he, and what he's teaching is from a revelation from Jesus. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, this means that it, we, you judge your pastor's words by the words of the apostles. Uh, that's the big difference. So the, we consider the writings of the apostles, to be Holy Scripture. They are God's Word. In Ephesians, 20, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, uh, St. Paul says that the house of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. He includes the, the apostles and prophets together, and Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. So the apostles and prophets make up Scripture. So this gives us confidence that the writings of the New Testament are God's inspired Word. So Mark and Luke, who, who are two evangelists who are not apostles, uh, they have the apostles, Peter and Paul, respectively, as, their, as the ones who, who, who led them. Uh, so the words uh, used by St. Paul and St. Peter that we all know, like the Second Timothy 3.16, where he says, you know, all Scripture is God-breathed, and Second Peter uh, 1, 19-21, where he says uh, that uh, no prophecy was ever uh, written by the will of man, but uh, men spoke as they were carried on by the Holy Spirit. Now, these words that St. Paul and St. Peter speak about Scripture uh, they apply to the writings of the apostles and the evangelists just as much as they do to the prophets of the Old Testament. So that he calls these men to be apostles is huge. Uh, it means that we should listen to their words as if it is God's word himself, and that we should consider the New Testament, Testament to be trustworthy and true to be the inspired word of God. Well, well said, well laid out the distinction between disciple and apostle and then how the Lord did use his apostles to record for us the word of God that we have, that we read, that we receive faith in Christ from beautifully said. Now, Mark names for us the 12 and, oh, we got about 15 minutes here, Pastor Preuss, to, to talk at least about some of them. We obviously know more about some than we do about others. And even within the text that Mark gives us, he gives us more details about some than others. The first three stand out. So we'll just start at the top of the list and, and see where we, where we end up. The first one named, and I think this is true of every list of the apostles, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. He's always the first listed. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's not the first called, but he's always the first listed. Uh, yeah, so Peter, well, he's the first pope, as you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there is a little bit of truth truth there. Like, obviously, we don't believe in papal supremacy. Uh, but Peter did have a leadership role among the apostles, and, and it's very obvious. Uh, he's the one who speaks the most. He's the one that Jesus speaks to the most. And uh, he is, uh, he's always given uh, prominence. So it kind of goes Peter's first, and then second you have uh, James and John. Uh, so Peter, of course, is the one who says, uh, I think you, did you say it was in chapter, Mark chapter 8? I know it's in, um, uh, no, it's not. That's Mark chapter 6, isn't it? Or 4. No, it's, no, I'm forgetting. I'm trying to remember where Peter, he says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living. You're the Christ, but then he doesn't say that he's the Son of the living God. It's at the very end uh, of, toward the end of chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I believe you. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't rem- I can't remember off, offhand. Uh, but uh, this is where, Jesus, where well, he's the one who says, you are the Christ, right? right. Uh, he's also the one who says, uh, you know, far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you, referring to his... Uh, to Jesus, when Jesus says that he's going to be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be crucified and die and, and rise on the third, third day. So Peter is very quick to speak, and he says some of the best things the apostles say, and he says some of the worst things the apostles say. He is said, uh, like in the very same chapter, in the very same scene, like literally Peter's feet have hardly moved. Uh, Jesus both says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is from heaven. And, you know, Peter takes a few steps, and then Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance for me, for you are not saying your, things, your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. 
So, I mean, uh, he's a huge character. Uh, he has a huge personality. We know a lot more about him. Uh, and like I said, the, the book of Mark is written by Mark, but Mark is, you know, like a student of, of Peter. Uh, and then Peter has the two epistles. So we know a lot about Peter. He speaks a lot. He seems to be the head guy in the church uh, or among the apostles. Uh, he is one of the three who is there for Jesus' transfiguration, as we know. He's the first. He denies Jesus three times in the garden. Jesus says that he's going to do it. Or not in the garden, but in the, in the courtyard. Uh, but Jesus, that's on that when he was betrayed, tells him that he will. Even though Peter says, even if I must die with you, I will never abandon you. And Jesus says, no, you're going to, you are going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. Uh, Jesus also tells Peter that Satan desired to sift him like wheat but that he prayed for him. So pretty much the reason why Peter repents and comes back is because Jesus prayed for him. And, he, and, he, and Jesus says to Peter, and when you return, strengthen your brethren. So he is given a, a leadership role. He's the first apostle to see Christ risen. Uh, and then he still has you know, some weaknesses recorded. Of course, like in Galatians, St. Paul says that he had to rebuke Peter again. But for the most part, uh, Peter has, is very positive. In, in, in the book of Acts, he gives this wonderful sermon on Pentecost. Um, he's the one who's put in prison as an angel comes and releases him. Um, he extends the right hand of fellowship to St. Paul. Um, what else is there to say about him? Jesus asks him three times if he loves me, he says, you have to do it, and Jesus says, feed my, my lambs. Um, there's another thing that I was going to say about Peter that I forgot. Oh, well, we're, we're going to lose him. We could talk for a whole hour about Peter, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be sufficient. But he's, he's a great example of, uh, of, of weakness, of faith, of falling away, of repenting, uh, an example of a good Christian, an example of a faithful preacher, an example of a sinner who's saved by grace. Oh, this, that's what I was going to say, I said, I, and I have to mention this because I said that he's the first pope. So he is the head of the, he is the, 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 the most important apostle, I guess, for lack of a better word. He's the main guy. But, uh, and, and the Roman Catholic Church says that he was the, the first pope of Rome, the first bishop of Rome. And in Matthew chapter... Um, now my mind's going going blank. It's it's, it's chapter uh, eight, right? Yeah, uh, no, it's chapter sixteen yeah, in uh, Matthew. Chapter 16, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah, chapter sixteen in Matthew. He says, uh, you know, he says, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And Jesus says, "You, Simon Bar Jonah." And then he says, uh, "And I say, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven." So this is the idea that Saint Peter, you know, has the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the pearly gates, and also that the Pope has authority over the whole church to bind and forgive sins and, and everything. Uh, the thing is, just a, a short answer: read Matthew chapter eighteen, read John chapter twenty. Jesus gives his exact same promises to all of the disciples and indeed to the whole church. So we as Lutherans do not believe that Peter is, uh, is the first pope and the head of the church, and the pope has this um, commission from God to be the leader of the whole Christian church. Rather, the keys to the kingdom of heaven are given to the whole church, as we learn in our catechism. Right, right. So then the next two named, and you, you mentioned them already because they often get put together with Peter, Peter, James, and John. James and John are brothers. We get more detail about them than some of the others. It says James is the son of Zebedee. John is the brother of James. And they have this extra name, the Sons of Thunder. Take us into to these two brothers. Yeah. So again, these are brothers. They're partners with Peter in his fishing. So we know that when they're called, they're, they're fishing in another boat. They're the Sons of Zebedee, who seems to be a very pious and good man. Like you said, they're, they're listed with Peter a lot. So sometimes... Jesus goes on alone, sometimes he goes just with Peter, sometimes he goes with Peter, James, and John, sometimes he's with the Twelve, and sometimes he's with the big crowd. So these three are important. Um, and they have, the, yeah, they're the sons of thunder. I really like that Jesus calls them the sons of thunder, because Scripture is very, very clear that you should think before you speak, and we should be slow to speak, slow to anger, and all of these things. Um, that all being said, there is a bad... We should not be so judgmental toward people who are zealous. You look, I mean, you look at Jesus' disciples. Two of them he named Sons of Thunder. Uh, one of them is called the Zealot. I mean, Jesus grabbed a bunch of, you know, very opinionated, very ready-to-fight, ready-to-speak men. Why? Well, because he wanted those who would, would preach with, um, uh, with passion, who would preach with conviction. So it's a good thing. Jesus is teasing them. He's 
he is, um, it's endearing. At the same time, he's pointing out both their weakness and their strength. Uh, an example of them being Sons of Thunder, uh, which is kind of, I think it's kind of funny. I think Jesus rebukes them afterward. But in Luke chapter 9, Jesus gets rejected by a Samaritan village. So then James and John say, Lord, do you want us to set fire down from heaven? Like, they're just so confident. Like, we'll destroy them for you, Lord. Uh, so they, uh, and then also, famously, their mother asks uh, that they sit at the right and left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And Jesus says, you don't know what this means. And of course, uh, they do end up dying for Christ. So... Uh, they didn't know what it meant, but Jesus did. Or, or I, I'm sorry, James died for Christ. John, of course, uh, lived to the end um, of his life. But, um, yeah, so, again, we could talk about them for a really long time, but uh, they, there's a lot in there about James and John. So oh, Also, go ahead. James, James was killed in Acts chapter 12 by Herod, right. and that's also what led to Peter being arrested, but then he gets rescued by an angel, and John uh, lives... To, he gets in exile on the island of Patmos. He's the author of First, Second, Third John, the Gospel of John. He's called the beloved disciple. Uh, Jesus says, if it's His will, then He would never then for Him to remain until He returns. What's that to you? He says that to Peter. And John points out that that does not mean He'll live until Christ returns. But you know, that if it's His will, He would. Uh, he also writes the Book of Revelation. Um, so I mean, there's so much you can say about e- either of these men. Um, but but James is, I think. He's James the, the Elder, and then you have John, who, of course, is the evangelist and an apostle, the, the one whom Jesus loves, and the only disciple who does not meet martyrdom. Hmm. After James and John, then Mark lists Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. we got seven minutes here, and I think, and I, I you know... I hesitate to lump a bunch of the apostles together. We could have spent the whole hour talking about about these twelve men, but I, I, I think I, I think Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, is going to provide a bulk of our conversation here. Give us just like can you give us like three minutes on everybody between James and John and Judas Iscariot, and then we'll pick up Judas Iscariot to close the hour. Okay, that sounds great. So Andrew is the first. A uh, disciple who is called, we see that in John chapter 1, he's the brother of Peter. So although he's the first one called, he isn't the, Peter's always listed as, as first in prominence. Um, and he also was a disciple of John the Baptist. So it's when John the Baptist says in John chapter 1, oh, Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Peter, or Andrew, and another disciple that isn't named, goes and follows Jesus, and then they go wherever he will go. Um, then Jesus, he's Philip. Philip is a companion of Nathaniel from the same town as Peter and Andrew. I assume that they were friends, uh, which is in uh, Bethsaida, and uh, Jesus tells him, follow him. Uh, then Philip runs to Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel isn't listed in this 12, but Bartholomew is. So I kind of think that Nathaniel is Bartholomew, uh, because Philip and Bartholomew are always listed together, and uh, Nathaniel and Philip are almost always listed together. And uh, so that, that they could be the same person. Bartholomew uh, means son of Bartholomew. Um, let's see here. Matthew. Uh, Matthew is probably one of the more well-known disciples. His name is also Levi. Does Matthew mean gift of God? Is that what it is? That's right. I think so. That's right. Right. So he was a, he was a tax collector. Uh, he's one of the guys that, they, like, a lot of these names, we just see the names. But uh, Matthew is one of those where, where the synoptic Gospels actually record Jesus calling him. So, like... With Simon the, the, the Cananean, Thaddeus, James the son of Alphaeus, even Thomas and Bartholomew. Well, maybe Bartholomew we do in, in John, but like we don't know when they were called, or Judas, we don't know when they were called. Uh, but Matthew, there's a big deal about him being called. He's usually called Levi, uh, and uh, he was a tax collector, and he's the one where there's a feast at his house with other tax collectors and so called sinners, and uh, Jesus is attacked for this, and Jesus says, I did not come to call the. Uh, righteous but sinners to repentance. So Matthew is clearly a sinner. Uh, he, was, he betrayed his, his nation by becoming a tax collector, but here Jesus calls him to the most wonderful work uh, of preaching the gospel. And of course he's the uh, author of the first gospel, Matthew, and I do believe that Matthew was written first. So you can listen to me with those old-timers, I guess. Uh, number eight, Thomas. I named my first son Thomas. Uh, I, I, I do like the name. He's called Doubting Thomas, but there's so much more to him than that. He's named in all four of the Gospels, so he's one of those disciples that we don't have to say, oh, well, maybe he's, you know, is Nathaniel and Bartholomew the same, or Thaddeus and Judas. 
but Thomas speaks a lot in John's Gospel. His name means twin, which is very significant, uh, because he says things that the other disciples are thinking. So when he's called Doubting Thomas, they were all doubting. I'm, I'm not just trying to defend the name of my son, but he's the one who says, let's go in, in John chapter 11, let's go with him that we might die with him. And that's the way they're all thinking. He's the one who says in John chapter 14, when Jesus says, you guys know the way, and he says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, he's speaking for all of them. And John chapter 20, and you can't tell me that any of those other ten disciples wouldn't have been there when Jesus appeared to them in the closed room, that they wouldn't have given the same answer that Thomas did, unless I see him and put my hands in his side, etc., I will never believe. And then he also gives the answer that he speaks for all of them when he says, my Lord and my God, which, of course, is the first uh, creed. Uh, so Thomas is awesome. He makes a wonderful confession. He shows both the weakness and the faith given by grace. And it, it said that he was a missionary to India and that he was martyred there. James, son of Alpheus, uh, maybe he's the cousin of Jesus. I don't know. And he might be the author of the epistle. He's called James the Lesser. Uh, Thaddeus, also known as Judas, the son of James, or my favorite title for him, Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> so he's the good Judas. I think he prefers to be called Thaddeus, although some say that that's his last name. And there are some things that they say that he wrote something or he did this or that. Uh, who knows? We don't have time, so I can't show my ignorance or, or uh, <laughs> of that. But he's one of those guys that doesn't say much about him in, in the Bible, except he, he asked the question in John chapter 14. Uh, and then uh, you have Simon the Canaanian. Canaanian probably doesn't mean that he's from Canaan, but probably that he is. He's also called Simon the Zealot. So Canaanian is probably a re- reference to a political party or political opinion. They're zealots. They want to fight the Romans. Uh, and... Uh, so, but then, again, some people think that he might be a Nathaniel. So maybe Bartholomew is not Nathaniel, it's, it's Simon. I don't know. Uh, and then you also have Judas Iscariot. That's the last one. So do we have time to talk about Judas? So we got two minutes here for Judas Iscariot. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll just go for it. Uh, Judas is the bad guy. There's so much. We could talk a whole hour, many hours about Judas. Um, Jesus lost one of his disciples whom he loved. Uh, Psalm 55 is about Judas. Uh, is it Psalm 35, too? Uh, uh, one of the Psalms, 30-something, talks about betrayal. But Psalm 55 definitely is it. Uh, he is Jesus' companion, and he betrays him. Um, this just shows how that, uh, you know, the tragedy, that there are those who believe and who fall away. He's probably the most well-known disciple, except for Peter. Uh, of course, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. He goes and hangs himself, and, his, and his break, the, the rope breaks, the branch breaks, and then his guts fall out. And then he ends up being replaced by um, Matthias. Um, although some say, well, then you have St. Paul who comes. Uh, Matthias, you don't really hear anything about him, but then you get St. Paul. Um, so Judas is tra- tragic. He loves money more than the Lord. He betrays him. I don't think we realize how awful the thing is that he did. He betrayed Jesus for silver. I mean, silver. I mean, that's like... Uh, I mean, it's, it's such a pathetic thing they did. And then it says that he also, he would steal from the treasury. People like widows and, and women were following them and providing their money so that these men could preach the gospel and, and uh, heal the sick. And they were giving money, and Judas was put in charge of it, and he, and he would steal it. Uh, so he, he, it's a tragedy. It, it, it shows um, that, I mean, there's a mystery of why there are, some are saved and some aren't. Um, but he is an important part. God even used Judas, this wicked man, for, for our salvation, uh, that uh, Jesus died for our sins and, uh, and rescued us. So we look at Judas with great mourning, but also it's a great, uh, with great mourning, but also it's a great warning. Uh, uh, take heed. If you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Uh, and, even Jesus, and it's also an encouragement to pastors. Even Jesus lost one of his disciples. Uh, so yes, there are going to be some who are going to deny the faith, but trust in Christ, uh, and, and don't let these things cause you to stumble. Pastor James Preuss is the pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa, helping us this morning with Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you so much. Jesus calls the 12, he appoints the 12, he gathers a new Israel to himself, the fulfillment of the promise he made to Abraham in the Old Testament. Jesus sends forth his word through these men. He calls them to be with them, to be learners, and then to proclaim the word. And that word has been proclaimed to you and to me, the word that has brought to us salvation in Christ. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.